My name is Blaine. I'm the CEO of Bright Immigration. Uh, we are a Toronto-based immigration company. And the reason I'm bringing this up is we meet thousands of people that want to come to Canada to start their lives. And I couldn't help but to derive some comparisons here between those individuals we meet daily to people such as yourselves and the people standing next to me. When it comes to two very important factors, opportunity and risk. People come to Canada for typically those two things. We met thousands of people and if I had to do a takeaway from why are they coming to Canada, it has to do with those two elements. Opportunity for them to have a better opportunity for economic growth for themselves and their family. An opportunity for them to be able to have a stability in from a, a political stable environment. An environment where they could kind of hang their hat and can, you know, generally anticipate what the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years will look like. And that's the opportunity. And we meet people every day who are searching and looking for this opportunity and want this opportunity. And they also come to us to be able to engage in people who could help them get the opportunity to be able to be in Canada, whether it improves their chances of approvals and things of that nature. On the other side of opportunity, there's risk. Now, risk is something as entrepreneurs or investors, that's all we think about. As an entrepreneur myself, that's all I think about is risk. Now, people come to us at Bright for risk because they are trying to minimize their risk, the risk that they're experiencing in their home country, whether it's political risk or economic risk, they want to better, they want to minimize that factor. They want to minimize the risk of a refusal. They want to minimize the risk of their lives, essentially. And we are very lucky to be in Canada, to be in a country where we get to experience both the upsides to those elements. We have a wonderful opportunity as Canadians to pretty much live a wonderful life, and we have the downside, the very minimalist risk, uh, the very minimizing element of risk. We're out of many of the countries in the world, and even countries where we thought was once a, 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 risk, a low risk environment, you know, we're lucky as Canadians to be here. So I couldn't help but to derive the comparisons between the individuals we meet every single day and people in front of me and the people to the left of me, where we're dealing with entrepreneurs and investors looking for opportunities and looking to minimize their risk. And with that being said, I'd like to introduce uh, our wonderful panel here, here to discuss what, how many of you guys want money? Raise your hands, anyone? Any, okay, how many is that? <laughs> Right, so we're here today to discuss money and how to basically, how to, what's the insights, what's your mindset, how to get inside the minds of experts. And going back to opportunity and risk, do you know how the best way to achieve good opportunity and to minimize your risk? Knowledge. You get knowledge, 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 knowledge. You read, you study, you ask experts, you ask people who know this industry, and that's a wonderful opportunity we have here today to be able to do that. So I'd like to introduce first Tony Duckett to my left here. Next, I'd like to uh, introduce you to o Oizen Aznak. And to the left of Ozan, you have Ingrid Rodriguez. And finally, Yuri Navarro. So I'd like to start off the panel by asking the first question here is, um, how does the culture of angel investor differ in Canada? versus other ecosystems in the world. Yeah, you're, you're, let's start to the left. Yeah, so, um, there we go. Uh, yeah, so I think actually Randy did a pretty adequate job. Uh, for those of you who are here for uh, Randy's kind of fireside chat uh, in describing a little bit of the cultural differences. Can we I expect a cuss word from you or no? Sorry? Can we uh, expect a cuss, cuss word? Cuss uh, <laughs> not, not right now. Maybe okay. you can get me later on. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I think he did a pretty adequate job in that I think, um, you know, there is, uh, you know, oftentimes we're uh, told that we're conservative in Canada versus the U.S. and these kind of things, but the reality is that um, just by the nature of the experience, uh, by the nature of the, um, you know, the amount of times we've been through the cycles of building companies, selling companies, and growing companies, um, that, you know, we're a bit ahead of some of the other ecosystems in other countries. Um, so I often say that, you know, Canada is maybe five to ten years behind kind of where Silicon Valley is, uh, maybe five years behind where Boston or New York is, um, and, uh, but we're probably about five or ten years ahead of where uh, Brazil is or, uh, or Chile is. 
Um, and so, uh, and, and what happens is that, you know, as you kind of develop an ecosystem, uh, that ecosystem develops its own culture of investment, its own culture of entrepreneurship. And, um, and so, you know, the, the, the nature uh, of the culture here is that you have people that are experienced operators um, who've built businesses before, who are now investing in companies, and are, l understand how to look at these companies and understand how to look at these risks and manage these risks uh, a bit better than sometimes investors in other markets do. And I think that that's very, uh, very important uh, because uh, if you're somebody who, yeah, as Randy was saying earlier, um, you're a traditional investment banker, um, you know, you're, uh, you invest in public markets, you invest in mining and resource industries, um, you know, taking uh, that mentality and trying to apply it to a startup where essentially you're investing in a couple of people on a laptop uh, is very difficult. Like just mentally speaking, it's very difficult. Uh, so I think that's one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest differences, um, and I think that uh, uh, you know the openness as well is another huge difference um, because as you develop these cultures, you kind of soon realize that openness is a huge component of of helping to support these companies. Transparency, um, you know, being able to talk freely with your investor about the problems that you're having and not have them kind of turn around and try to replace you. Um, you know that kind of stuff. So, uh, so this is this is where I think a lot of the differences are. Yeah, I think. I mean, I'm I'm less familiar with the Canadian uh, investor ec ecosystem, but I can tell you about the Latin America, which no everyone here knows. And I would tell you that I think investors in Latin America or companies in Latin America, what we're looking for is trying to institutionalize and be more corporate about the process of investing. I don't know if it happens to you, but I'm from Mexico, and in Mexico what happens is that the investors, no, the, 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 the private equity or the venture capital, the startup community, has been growing for the past decade. Before that, it was more of a family-owned business, and, and when your son wanted to put, a, uh, put up a new business, no, you you join with the with the uncle and with the and with the grandparent and everyone put up money and then they will fund no the the kids venture. So what happened is that in Latin America probably most of the ventures from t before ten years ago everything was more traditional, more familiar on the side, less corporate, less institutional. And I think what we've seen in Latin America is that we're we're trying to move no on that step and, and trying to to big to jump into the the big leagues and trying to do things right from the beginning no and, and companies such as uh, our company is that what we're, what we're trying to to bring into the market to help entrepreneurs uh, have a better platform to to have access to capital to grow their business to have better support um, and also I think other thing that 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 is different is that uh, we, and, and Randy mentioned this earlier, and I think everyone's been speaking about it, how the, the, when we think about startups and entrepreneurs, we try to feed these entrepreneurs into the Silicon Valley model. And then when you take a Latin American company, you try to put it into that box, it just doesn't fit quite okay. So you're trying to look for investors no, that have a little bit more perspective outside from the Silicon Valley model and, and just adapt to your model and just work with you as an investor and I don't know how to say this in English, but to tropicalize no, the, the, the investment relationship that you have. And that, I think, works better with, no, uh, with uh, other ecosystems, such as the Canadian, that has been bringing such diversity into their own, into their own country, no? I agree. <laughs> uh, I mean, you're right. I mean, I think um, uh, the, the institutionalization of certain aspects of the investment process, due diligence, uh, s you know, forms of term sheets, etc. That's very important. It's very important, especially to 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 create an ecosystem of angel investors, especially in the emerging markets. Uh, we've done and we still have a lot of work uh, to do here in Canada as well on that on that front. But ultimately. What it comes down to is really the business, the fundamentals of the business. You know, does it? Are you? Uh, is the business really? You know, trying to solve a fictitious problem? Uh, is you know how the strategy to sell sales, etc., revenues. How are you going to grow? How are you going to scale? And there are different nuances to scale and grow in different parts of the world. And that's why you do the tropicalization. <laughs> uh, and you need to do that. And you know, not every Silicon Valley company fits in Toronto. And not every Toronto company fits in Mexico City or Silicon Valley, et cetera. So we really need to uh, find the nuances. And the only way to really do that is to engage with the local angel community, bring them on board, uh, be open, uh, be transparent, and, uh, and, and really do your homework. Uh, market research isn't about internet 
research. Market research is actually how are other companies selling? What kind of channels are they using? Once you figure that out, and once you figure out how to actually communicate that and articulate that to the investor community, then yes, you can start getting some investor traction, not just from the, uh, the angel community, but from certain you know, venture funds, et cetera. Wow, how do I add to that? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need another question. I think that's yeah, okay, Tony, yeah. that's okay, uh, Tony. That is about as complete an, an analysis as we can have. Yeah, so. I, I agree with that. Um, you mentioned term sheets. What is the importance of term sheets in North America and having a North American term sheet? Um, Great question. Uh, I think there's other people on the panel who could probably answer that better. So I'm going to pass the mic. Because I'm sure. going to be able to do that. So uh, just um, on, from the Crutch Forum platform, we do a lot of international. We're, uh, even in Canada, 30-40% of our deal flow is non-Canadian. So uh, we do a lot of cross-border uh, investing. Um, uh, and not just into the U.S., obviously, some to Asia and to, into Europe, etc. as well. Uh, term sheets are important. Uh, and, and they do, their, their term sheets are meant to protect the investor and protect the entrepreneur, uh, depending on which jurisdiction you're in, depending on uh, what field you're in. Uh, it is a very, very important legal document that will bind you uh, in a contract. So it's very important to get local insight. Uh, one of the things that we do, for example, specifically on the life sciences investments cross-border, uh, we've synchronized our, our term sheets uh, for Canadian and U.S. investors, specifically in the Philadelphia-Boston corridor, uh, so that it's easier for us to syndicate deals back and forth. Uh, we understand the business, but we need to actually also invest in a, in a similar term sheet. So everybody's in the same boat as angel investors. Once you get more institutional investors on board, venture capital, et cetera, they could probably have their own term sheets, et cetera, but it is an important factor. You need to pay attention, get counsel. Uh, this isn't a template job. Uh, you really need to get some sort of counsel to really kind of push it through, uh, to, to make it more serious. Sure. Yeah, so um, uh, yeah, the only thing I'll add to that is like, I always say to people, um, angel investment, um, Startup investment generally, but angel investment in particular, is a social network activity, which means deals get done on the basis of people getting to know each other and people trusting each other. And so this is also what Randy was talking about, the importance of overcoming the trust barrier in some of the emerging markets. Um, the, the reality is, if you don't uh, trust each other, if you don't have a relationship and if you don't like each other, uh, no legal document, uh, no matter how well crafted, will get the deal done. Uh, now, having said that, once you're at the point, you have a meeting of the minds and, um, you know, you want to do the deal, then it's all about overcoming the obstacles. And there are a lot of obstacles to getting a deal done. There's a lot of friction points in the process of getting a deal done. Um, the term sheets is one particular one that has a lot of importance to it um, for various reasons. Um, the term sheet is important on the basis of the nature of the investment or the nature of the deal you're cutting. Uh, so in other words, at the time that you're making the investment, what are the terms? Um, what are you agreeing to give up? What are you getting in return? Um, and, and, and that's important at that time. But what a lot of people fail to realize is that it's also very important from the factor of what will happen the next time you go out to get money. And, and so, you know, the term sheet that you sign with somebody today is going to be looked at by the next investor that comes in and wants to give you money the next time. And if you don't get things aligned in a way that is kind of standard and is uh, kind of clean cut, uh, it can actually have the effect of shying away other investors and, and potentially uh, closing deals that would otherwise happen. So if you think about it from the point of view of, a, of an investor, uh, if I have, um, you know, two companies that have a equivalent probability of success and potential for growth, um, and, uh, and I like both companies, and I have one where uh, I have a simple term sheet that I can just kind of give them my term sheet now, and, and it all kind of works nicely together. And on the other hand, I have somebody who's engineered a deal that is complex, has all kinds of different legal maneuvers and, and, and clauses in there that uh, could affect me as an investor, could affect the entrepreneur as an investor and their motivation. Uh, I now have to spend time and money getting a lawyer to help clean this up and push the other investor out. And why would I do that? You know, if I have the two options, I'm going to go with the one that's easy. Right, so it's very important to get those things aligned, and you know, I think in the Canadian context, 
if anybody wants to educate themselves, uh, you're more than welcome to go on our website, uh, which is uh, www.nacocanada.com. Uh, on there, there's a, a tab for Common Docs. Uh, and this is an initiative we did two years ago where we actually went across the country working with seven law firms uh, to set up templates. And, and just you know, to add to what Ozan was saying, they're templates. That don't take these and like use them. The point is, it's an educational material, right? So there's there's a common pref, convertible debt, and uh, safe uh, version in there. Uh, and for each one of the templates, we go term by term explaining what the term means, how it's used from the investor's perspective, from the entrepreneur's perspective, and the situations where it's appropriate to use them or not. Um, and like you could spend days just going through this. It's a it's an online resource. It's open to everybody. Um, we did it for the community, and uh, it's, it's been downloaded like 14,000 times. You see these term sheets now everywhere. Um, so if you want to learn, that's a great resource to kind of get started on on what is normal in, in terms of structuring a deal. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that. <laughs> Um, this message is for Tony. Um, in addition to... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You're, it's your turn. <laughs> um, in addition to and as an advancement to traditional co-investment agreements, what are some other ways Canadian investors can work with LATAM investors? Thank you, Blaine. <coughs> uh, buenos dias. Uh, estoy feliz de estar... Uh, yo siento chéverísimo de estar uh, aquí con ustedes platicando. Entonces... Um, anyway, the theme, one of the themes that we were going to be talking about here was um, co-investment. Um, and never having done like formal, I kind of think the kind of formal uh, traditional co-investment that uh, you folks probably have done to date, um, having uh, <clears throat> started a, a, a small boutique uh, venture fund last year, so we're still in the growth phase and everything. So I started to reflect on it and I said, maybe there are, you know, rather than just if, if you're a startup in Latin America um, and you want some, some investment from uh, Canadians or North Americans and you, know, you want to work with uh, uh, your own uh, investors in, in, the company, in the country that you're in, in uh, Latin America, I started to think a little bit about that and I, I realized that we kind of have been doing it at uh, Zy Ventures, which is the fund we have. Um, we invested in, a, in an Irish company, the Irish uh, Republic, um, and we put some seed money in. And uh, as, as we went along, um, we helped them acquire a small Canadian company, which gave them a Canadian presence. And then they needed some more money, so we, uh, we put in a little bit more and we found some other investors. Uh, I think one in Ireland and one in, the, in Canada. Um, so that became sort of like a co-investment. And the good thing about um, the Irish is they have a lot of if so we I think we we put together 250,000 euros and they were the government matches that for two, a, a grant of 250,000 euros so suddenly they had 500,000 euros which was a great thing and in parallel to that they engaged the services of a, of a marketing company over here uh, the Branham Group um, this this startup to get them clients here in Canada so to leverage the, the small acquisition that we had helped them acquire, which was a Canadian company. So it all started to come together, and this kind of segues a little bit with what uh, Mayor Tory was saying this morning is, um, I've started to think that, now we did this with an Irish company, um, and the Brandon Group and I are now al also helping Latin American companies, uh, you know, bigger sort of enterprise level uh, country, uh, companies, Get a get a toehold in the North American market through the Branham Group's marketing skills, and I had a little bit of operational experience. Um, so it start from a from a co-investing perspective. I think there's there's a real potential um, to for a Lat Latam startups uh, to incorporate here in Canada or to get a presence here in Canada, which Miriam is doing already at the startup level, but at the perhaps at the scale up level. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity uh, for companies to incorporate here. Uh, we're bringing along, two, there's two potential investors they could bring with them from Latin America as traditional venture capitalists or uh, um, investors. But we've also done, one of the things we did uh, with the Irish company I forgot to mention is we hooked them up with a, a, a software development factory in Uruguay in Montevideo who invested uh, cash into them and then got 
you know, a commitment to do uh, services after that. So we put together this, uh, all these dif disparate kind of things, and now we've got a company that's Irish, who's got a partner in Uruguay who owns a chunk of the company, and now is launching into the Canadian market with investment from the Irish government and, and Canadian investors. So I think there's a strong opportunity to do that with LATAM companies, because I think uh, I've been down to Colombia, I've been to Peru, I've been to Chile to meet, uh, there's a lot of big software uh, development companies that really want to get a, an offshore kind of, uh, they want to get into the North American market. And there's, you know, I think a lot of things have come together in the Toronto market right now with the startups and all the ecosystem and et cetera. So uh, that would be my little spin on, on, on co-investment. Doesn't necessarily have to be the traditional kind of, uh, finding a, a Canadian investor and a, a Latin investor to invest in a startup. Because there is a hesitancy, I think, on the part of Canadian investors to invest in Latin American s startups, um, just for a whole bunch of reasons that we can, uh, we can talk about. But if, if, they're, if they get their toehold here in Canada and incorporate part of their entity or all of their entity here in Canada, suddenly they become a Canadian entity, they can leverage all the, all the wonderful ecosystem things that are being done here by the Canadian and the Ontario governments, as well as uh, leveraging you know, their home country uh, export kind of facilities and things like that. So it becomes kind of a win-win-win for, for, for all, all parties. So that would be a bit of my spin on, on the co-investment on that side. So Can I take a stab at it? Go ahead, yeah, certainly. Uh, so uh, just from an investor's perspective, uh, co-investing is really cooperation, uh, trying to find it. It doesn't just come fall on your lap. You have to actually find the opportunity to uh, cooperate, uh, two companies. And we have to keep an open mind. Uh, investment can take many, many, many different forms. There's nothing ever written in stone. Uh, you could have uh, hybrid convertible debts, the debt, the equity, the joint ventures, to in-kind, to you name it. Earn in, earn out, you name it, you got it. Uh, what's important is how do two companies or how does the investor and the company cooperate and grow together? Uh, that's the, uh, that's the, there's so many variables that you discussed, iron over your in, in kind, tech development, this and that. These are all variables that lead to a cooperation and potentially a co-investment. And that's the only way we can do this. We're not going to have a Latin American company come up to Canada and boom, let's go. It's magic. We've got investors here for you all ready to waiting for, you know, for these companies to come in. That doesn't happen. That's just fantasy. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I mean, the same, uh, I, I tell this to everybody as well. And you guys, uh, you know, back in Mexico, you don't wake up in the morning and say, I wonder how I can invest into Canadian companies, <laughs> right? Uh, it's the same way. We have to create that opportunity of investment so that we could actually create a scenario, a script to put our money together. Uh, and that's the key, I think. And I would add something, if I might. Um, this thing that they're mentioning is very important. I think that we in Latin America just think of the opportunity, since it's such a huge opportunity in the, in the Latin American market with the demographics that we have and the increasing uh, income that we have. No? So we're just trying to tend to that market. And since there's so much opportunity in Mexico and in Colombia and in Brazil, there's just so little time to think outside of that market because you're trying to grow that, no? So it's it's like very difficult to think that you you might be the one that adding value to another company, no? Such as you were mentioning uh, with with your example. So probably this type of, of institution, no? the LATAM startups and this type of, of aggregators of, of the ecosystem are very helpful because when you think of your company, it's just not, no? If I, it's not a linear thing, you don't have to first tend to the Brazilian or the Mexican market, and then when you're finished with that market, you will move up to the Canadian market. So th these are parallel things that might be happening, and you might learn a lot of things with investors, with companies, participating through joint ventures or through other type of, of, of activities, other than just receiving capital, or other just, than just putting your headquarters in Toronto. And I think that is, uh, that is something that we need to think, that it's not just this linear process. It's, it, can be, it, ca it can have many layers, and this type of, of institutions, no, that we're all here because of, 
can leverage that part and then we can jump ahead in institutionalization on in corporate governance or in um, uh, associations that might help bring us to our final goal in our local market even faster. No? So we might try to think on, on that layer side. I, I, I just, I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, the theme is, is um, it's kind of similar to what was being discussed before, which is it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like dating, you know, was what Randy was saying earlier. Um, you know, you get to know each other. Uh, dating is tough. Going to a bar and, you know, uh, trying to find somebody that maybe will become a partner for 10 years is tough. Uh, and, uh, and don't ever, ever go up to somebody at a bar and be like, hey, you want to go to bed, <laughs> right? Like that's, that's almost guaranteed to fail. So don't ever go to an investor and say, hi, I've never met you before, but can you give me some money? You know what I mean? It's, it's just not the way things what, work. It doesn't work? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, so you know, I think, I think what's really important about the co-investment journey is the relationships that you build with people to get to the co-investment. I think that's what everybody's really trying to mm -hmm. hint at here is, is that it does happen. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of it actually uh, with Latin America in particular, uh, between Canada and Latin America. And there are, it, it's a minority of the population for sure, but there are investors here that are willing and are interested in the opportunities like Randy and others um, in Latin America. But uh, at the end of the day, Randy won't write you a check unless if he actually gets to know you first. And so, uh, you know, coming up here uh, for, for events like this, getting to know the community, um, you know, getting to know some of the investors. Oftentimes, I would say if you have investors back home, bring them with you because they're your biggest champions. I mean, the first thing the angel investor in Canada is going to want to know is what is your angel investor in Quito or, you know, Santiago or Buenos Aires think about you? Right. And so, you know, that's that, just think about it as any other human relationship, as any other friendship that you build over time. Um, and uh, but it's solely within the realm of possible.